All right, so last week when we left off, we left off here in uh, 1 Samuel 8, and it was really where Israel is asking for a king. Israel saying, hey, you know, we want to be like all the other nations. Uh, so uh, chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Then all the leaders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. And so then Samuel uh, speaks to the Lord and the Lord tells him, look, it's not a good idea, but give them what they want. Uh, and, uh, and so he goes in and, and tells them all the negative things that are going to happen if he gives them a king. And uh, in the end, it says in uh, verse 19, it says, nevertheless, the people used to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And, and this was the whole kind of tragedy of these, uh, uh, this mindset was all about, uh, you know, we want a king, we want a human to fight our battles when God had been fighting the battles for them all along up until this point. And so now they have to find the king. Uh, and here Samuel uh, is really introducing us to Saul. Okay, uh, chapter one, verse nine says, Saul chosen to be king. There was a man in Benjamin whose name was Kish and the son of Abiel, the son of Zehor, the son of Betcherad, the son of um, Apriah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. This sounds like he had a really long neck, okay? From his shoulders upwards, he was taller than any of the people. And he was good looking. He was very handsome. And this is important. You're going to see why uh, pretty soon. He was a handsome man. And then, uh, you know, I'm not going to cover all this stuff. And there's a lot of stories within this, by the way. A lot of you will think of Jonathan and some of the other stuff. Um, th there's a point I want to get to because all of this is about us learning about God's character and how we're to relate to him. So that's the focus of, of these of these messages. So I'm going to skip a bunch of things. I know you guys know some of these stories, but, uh, but I'm going to stick to the stuff that's really important. And I'll point those things out. Verse 6, and he said to him, look, now there is in this city a man of God, and he's an honorable man. All that he says surely comes to pass. So let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way we should go. And this is because uh, Saul is looking uh, for some livestock and they can't find them. And uh, they're looking for this person who's uh, basically what they call a seer. The seer is really uh, a prophet. They used to call them seers. Now they call them prophets. And this is where they encounter Saul. Samuel encounters Saul. It says verse 15. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people, because their cry has come to me. So Saul, becoming king, is chosen by God. The process of providing them a king was chosen by the people, but God is anointing Saul to become king by telling Samuel that this is the man. And so as they go down and they meet and speak, verse 21 says, and Saul answered and said, am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? You see, what's happening is Saul is seeing his own insignificance before Samuel. He's saying, my tribe is the smallest tribe. We're not significant. Why are you even speaking to me? Why are you talking these things to me? And, and this just shows you that, again, God doesn't look the way that we look. God looks on the heart and God looks for people uh, to serve him in ways that we wouldn't normally think of ourselves. Another person that we saw do this was Moses. Moses gave uh, the Lord so many reasons why he was not the one that should go and serve him by speaking to Pharaoh. You know, I can't do it. They're not going to, he's not going to listen to me. And then in the end, he's like, I can't even speak because I've got a, a stutter and I'm not, uh, I'm not very good uh, on my feet. And God's like, you know, here's, here's someone else to speak for you. All right. So God looks differently than the way that we look. And this is Saul trying to give reasons why, uh, you know, why are you even talking to me? But in the end, Samuel explains to him what he needs to do. And then in the end, it says, as they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servant to go ahead on, to go on ahead of us 
And he went on, but you stand here a while that I may announce to you the word of God. And so uh, now he starts to, to, to perform this uh, uh, ritual. Uh, it says, then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? When you depart from me today, you'll find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zela, and they will say to you, the donkeys which you look for have been found. And now, and, and he goes on to tell him what's going to happen. And, and the reason he does this is this is confirmation. Okay, it's confirmation to Saul that this is a God thing. And then this is the bit that's really interesting. In verse six, it says, then the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. You'll become a different person. And let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. And this is an important point here. Remember that when, when God had given them the law and had spoken to the, to the Israelites, he had told them that there would be a kingdom or there would be a people of kings and priests. There was a separation in roles for Israel between kings and priests. And kings were there to lead the people and wage war and do all those things and judge the people. And the priests would be the ones that would speak to God, would hear from the Lord and tell the people what God was saying. That's important to keep in mind. Okay, But this is where the, the, I believe that the story of, of Saul is so important because this is where we can get trapped in thinking that we uh, we're to do things that we're not necessarily called to do. And you'll see that in a moment. But he's telling him that the spirit of the Lord will come upon him and he'll be turned into another man. And so Saul is proclaimed king and, uh, and Samuel is telling now all of Israel. Verse 20, it says, and when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. And we had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families. The family of Matri was chosen and Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. He'd run away. He was hiding. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord further. Has the man come here yet? And the Lord, world champion at hide and seek, the Lord answered, there he is, hidden amongst the equipment. Okay, he found him. He's shown him where he is. So they ran and brought him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is no one like him among all the people? So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. What Saul was doing, and this was a mistake, sorry, but Samuel was doing, I believe this is a mistake on his part, is that Samuel was showing people, look, Saul is big, he's tall, he's bigger than anybody else. Why does that matter? Because in human terms, we look at the size of a person and we make an inference and we say, well, if he's big, if he's tall, if he's powerful, if he's handsome, that's who we want our leader to be. And so he's appealing to their carnality, to their eyes, to what they're seeing. So what does this do for Saul? He looks around and says, wow, I am the biggest. I am the tallest. It starts to, to breed in him a sense of self-assurance. And that's ultimately what leads to his downfall. I'm going to show you that in a moment. This is Samuel 12. And so it says in verse 13, it says, Now, therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. And take note, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. So he's telling them, look, you have a king because he's already explained to them. You know, remember uh, earlier, he already explained to them that, that a king was going to be tough for them, that they would struggle with a king and that that was not God's plan. But they said, we want a king anyway in chapter eight. And he's now telling them, look, God's given you a king as you requested. If you and your king serve the Lord and continue to do the things that God has asked you to do, then God will be with you. But if you don't, then it doesn't matter that you have a king. God's hand will be against you the same as it was against your fathers when they were disobedient. So he's reminding them of their responsibilities 
uh, in order to serve God in the right way, irrespective of this new governance structure that they now have. So it's important that, 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 that they realize that they're not let off the hook from serving God just because they have a king. And he goes on to tell them more about this. Uh, you know, in verse 22, it says, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make his people. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. So as always, you know, God is really clear. He gives them specific instructions. And then it's up to them to follow those instructions and to obey the Lord. And when you get outside of that, that's when you have problems. And this is when the fun begins. So Saul had been reigning at this stage two years over Israel. Saul ends up reigning over Israel for 40 years. But this was in his second year. Okay, so you're still fairly new. But what ends up happening is they get attacked by the Philistines and they're going to war. So it says here in, in verse five, it says, then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand, which is on the seashore in multitude. So there's lots. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger for the people were distressed then the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrew crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. So if you remember, Samuel said, wait seven days, and I will come, and I will, uh, and I will set a burnt offering. It says, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Remember, I just said before that Israel was a, was a nation of kings and priests. Saul was a king. He was not a priest. That might not sound like a big deal. It was a huge deal. This was like the, you know, the separation of powers. You couldn't do, one couldn't do the other. Verse 10, it says, Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, The Philistines will now come on me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. You notice, this is very much an Adam and Eve scenario. Adam, why did you eat? This woman you gave me, right? This woman you gave me. So Samuel's saying, what have you done? Why did you make this offering? Saul said, you didn't come in time. It's your fault. You didn't come within the time frame that you said you would. And I felt compelled. In other words, I got into fear. I got into my own head and now I'm looking at the circumstance and I am breaching God's laws because it's all about me. That's what he did. He took it upon himself and watch the response. Verse, uh, verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord, your God, which he commanded you for now, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So Saul now realizes his mistake. And it wasn't a mistake because he knew what he was doing. He had lost. He, he basically did what Abraham did when he lost patience with God bringing Isaac that he had his own Ishmael. He created an Ishmael with the burnt offering. And that's because what we have to understand is, is who was Saul? Saul was the first king. He was a handsome man. He was the most handsome. He was taller than everybody else. And now he looked around and said, who is like me? 
and and he decided to breach the simple separation between priests and kings and it led to god removing him as king because he did the opposite of what god commanded him to do and you might think well you know but why didn't samuel come in time that that doesn't matter it's not about when samuel comes because Saul wasn't there to serve Samuel. Saul, Saul was there to serve the Lord. And Saul knew very well that he wasn't to do this. But because he thought that in his own strength he could do it, he decided to breach the law of God. And you can see this here in the next verse. And this is what I want to uh, kind of hone in on and, and spend time on, because this is where we can learn. Verse 15, chapter 15, verse 1. Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now, go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. And watch this. He gives him strict commands. But kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. And they go on and, and you know, it explains about the, the war. And then verse 9, it says, But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself. And he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? He's talking about why are all these animals here? You were told to utterly destroy everything. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen, to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over all Israel? So you see, he's saying, when you said, who am I that you're even speaking to me? I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest of tribes. He's saying, when you were nothing and God raised you up, did not the Lord anoint you king? Verse 18, now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil? and do evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen and best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God. He keeps referring to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And, and this is this shows you the heart of God, this is, an important, this is an important lesson I'm going to share right here. This is very, very important. I'm going to show you the heart of God, and I'm going to show you the, the, the issue for Saul. Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So what's Samuel saying? He's saying, Saul, your perspective is wrong. Saul's perspective was, I obeyed God because I went on this mission and I destroyed the Amalekites. But he did it the way that he thought best, the same way that he sacrificed when he shouldn't have, 
This time, he was told to destroy everything. And he said, I know better. I'm not going to, I'm not going to kill the best sheep and the best oxen. And, and, and I'm not going to destroy the good things. We're going to take those back with us. Even though God told us to destroy it all. Because yes, God told me to do it, but I'm going to do it my way. And when Samuel said to him, why did you do evil in the sight of the Lord? In verse 19, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul's response to Samuel is, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. He didn't understand that doing it his own way is the same as disobedience. It says here, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. What does that mean? To obey is better than sacrifice. And this is, the, this is a spiritual, this is, this is what I want to talk about tonight, what I think is the key lesson out of this for us as believers. We spend our time telling the Lord what he should value. We spend our time oftentimes, especially when we haven't understood the concept of grace and, and the concept of what's happened on the cross, we think that to sacrifice is better than to obey. And I'll prove it to you. How many of us will, will go to the Lord and say, but Lord, I've done this. I've done this. I've given. I've prayed. I've, you know, I've gone to church and I'm not being healed. I'm not being prospered. I'm not seeing breakthrough in my relationship. Lord, I've been serving in the church for decades. And now this thing, whatever your circumstances has happened, what are you telling the Lord? You're saying, I've sacrificed so much. Why aren't I getting what I want? Why is this thing not working? But see, obedience is better than sacrifice. God tells us how to behave and what to do. And many times we do things our own way and expect God to value it with the same eyes that we value it with. And that's where we get in trouble. We don't realize that God values things differently. God is valuing, in this case, he values obedience more than sacrifice. He's, it says for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. In other words, he was Saul was rebelling against God. He was saying, I know what you told me, Lord, but I'm still going to do it this way. I think doing it this way is the better way. And all he's doing is he's setting aside the commandments of God. It says, as, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. He equates stubbornness, being stubborn, is the same as iniquity and idolatry. Why is that? I mean, there's so much in this. I don't have time to cover it all. But, but think about it. What is stubbornness? Stubbornness says, I'm going to do it my own way. My way is better. Well, who are you worshiping when, when, when you're saying that? You're worshiping yourself. God says, do it this way. And you say, I'm going to do it my own way. You are idolizing yourself. You are setting yourself up above God. Now, you may never have thought of it that way, but that's what you're doing. When you put your own ways of doing things above God's ways, that's the same as idolatry. And most people say, well, you know, I don't have, you know, I don't have a, a statue. I'm not bowing down towards it. I'm not. No, of course not. We're not doing that. But what we are doing is we're setting up our own things ahead of what God says. And so, so the, 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 the issue for Saul is, is that his mindset is wrong. He has completely misunderstood the point was to obey, not to be stubborn and not to offer sacrifice. God's not looking for sacrifice. He's looking for obedience. God's looking for people to follow, in this case, the rules and the laws that he set down. And Saul is trying to convince Samuel and God ultimately that what he did was the better way. And so there's rebellion there. And so what we oftentimes do is try and convince God that our way of achieving his purpose is better than his way. It's one of the reasons why it says that we need to labor to rest. You know, and I've been asked this question a lot and we'll do a, we'll do a, a, a you know, a session on it where we explain in more detail, but, but to labor to rest is simply saying that I'm going to fight for my peace. You know, I'm going to fight for my peace. I am going to labor in order to rest. And people think, well, hang on, how do you labor to rest? I mean, it's labor. Why are you resting? The labor is in not doing anything. The labor is in trusting God. The labor is that once we've done all that we can to stand and stand there for, and we have to, to, to have the right mindset and the right understanding of who God is and what he's looking for from us. 
And when we decide to become our own king, right? Well, Israel wants its own king. When we decide to do that, we're doing things backwards. And God's saying, let me be your deliverer. Let me fight your battles. And oftentimes we say, no, Lord, let me sacrifice for that. You know, let me go and do the things that I think you want me to do. And when I do those things, then I can come to you with my little Christian, you know, equivalent of scalps, you know. Uh, you know, I've gotten the, the all these scalps from different things that I've done, where I've given, where I've served, where I've ministered, where I've done whatever. And then I present them to the Lord as if that's some sort of a trade with him to say, well, now that I've done all these things, that's the reason uh, that the Lord should listen to my prayers and give me the things that I've been asking him for. And that's not the way it works. And this was the challenge for Saul. He started trusting in himself because he was a good looking man because Saul was taller than everybody else, because he was the first king, he decided that he knew better than God. And because of that, verse 24 says, Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. He's trying to get out of it. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at Gilbeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. He never met with him again. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. And then we see here in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. So what this shows you is that God has said, look, stop crying over spilt milk. Yes, it's no good what's happened to Saul, but pick yourself up, fill your horn with oil, and start again. And so God, you can see, God's original choice for Israel wasn't David. We'll, do, we'll, we'll talk about David another time. But God's original choice was Saul, and Saul messed up. Where are the parallels in that? Who did Jesus come for? He came for the lost tribes of Israel. He came for Israel and Israel rejected him. God is a God of second chances. God is a God that is able to bring beauty from ashes. And even in this story from, from Saul, the fact that Saul didn't live up to what God wanted didn't mean that God set Israel aside. He had to find another king. And yet, although we think of David as being the ultimate, and you know, David was an amazing king, he was not God's first choice. God's first choice was Saul. But because Saul didn't pull his side of the bargain, God set him aside. And the, 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 the challenge I have for us is twofold. Number one, the story of Saul, what's so important is that we're not to trust in our own abilities. We are not to trust ourselves. We are to obey the Lord and do the things that he calls us to do. Now, yes, we don't have sacrifices and burnt offerings, but we've created plenty of our own. Many Christians have created plenty of their own sacrifices and burnt offerings and things that they think are going to appease the Lord and get what they want from the Lord. And, and that's just not the case, number one. And number two, it says that obedience is better than sacrifice. In other words, the Lord just wants us to follow the things that he's asked us to do without us having to come up with our own way of doing things. God doesn't want us to invent our own ways of relating to him. He's told us how he wants us to relate to him. And I think for many people, they are doing the things that they think are best instead of doing it God's way. They're doing it a good way and not God's way. And so I want to encourage you, you know, the, the lesson from Saul, yes, there's a lot in there, um, but, but, the, but the things to remember is that God wants obedience and not sacrifice. God wants relationship, not religion. God wants us to follow him from the heart because it's, it's our heart that he looks at not the actions. The actions are not what's the most important thing to God. God's looking at our hearts. If our heart is right, then our actions will be right. You can't fix things from the outside. And unfortunately, you know, so much of the church's message is fix yourself so that you're pleasing to God. And it's quite the opposite. 
when you are in relationship with God, you will automatically begin to change. And that's the, that's my uh, encouragement for you tonight is think about where are the areas where you have thought that sacrifice was more important than obedience. Where are the areas where you're serving God out of a sense of duty and obligation rather than from a, from a position of, of love and a response for what God has done for us, because that's where you'll be doing the sacrifice bit instead of the obedience bit. And it's important for us as believers to make sure that we don't get those things switched around because we'll be focused so much on the doing rather than the being. We'll be focused so much on the religion and not on the relationship. And I think that's where the gap is for many people and why they're frustrated in their faith because they're trying to do something that was never set out by God. And, and this is a good example of that where someone had all the reasons to think that they were special. And even though they were anointed by God, they came from, from a nothing place from, the, from the, the tribe of Benjamin. They started to look at their own ability. And because of that, they went around and did the opposite of what God wanted. And ultimately, they got removed. So the lesson out of Saul for me is distinguishing between God's heart and, and what our actions are versus what we think they should be. And then ensuring that our heart is soft. So when God speaks to us, when God tells us, hey, that's not what I'm after, that we put that into practice. We don't just continue mindlessly doing things. And I've seen people in church get burnt out because they've been serving for years. And, and, and you know, if you're serving and getting burnt out, you're doing it wrong. You shouldn't get burnt out because of serving. You shouldn't get burnt out when you're ministering. I'm not saying, I'm not criticizing anyone. I'm saying that people don't get burnt out. But the reason you're getting burnt out is because you're doing it uh, from a position of, of requirement, not from a position of a love response to God. Because when you're serving God out of love, you can't get tired. It's not possible. Because like we did last time when I had that disobedient cup that wouldn't fill, right? When we're serving out of the overflow, it's an overflow. We're not serving from a place of dryness. We're serving from a place of overflow. And so that's my encouragement to you tonight is to just reassess some of the things that you're doing. If you're serving in a church, if you're doing things that you feel that you need to do, I want to encourage you to go back to your first love and think about what are the areas that really God is showing you uh, where you could be serving him or doing the things that you feel you need to do versus doing it God's way. And I think the story of Saul is really good for us to be able to see uh, God's way versus our way.